And we're live. Hello, everyone from beautiful Fungaray. It's been a rainy day, but we don't care because we're inside and enjoying, well, a cold night. Uh, wherever you are, hope you're well and uh, your day's been good. And of course, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you're probably, I don't know, maybe still enjoying some of the morning daylight. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for um, joining us here from New Zealand, up here in Whangarei, in the beautiful winterless north, which is in the middle of winter right now. So tonight, my guest is, uh, I have a special guest, and then I have a co-host. So I've got Richard Cranenborough, who's been an art teacher for a while, a designer, uh, working with architecture, as well as uh, recently, uh, in the last few months, uh, opened up his own gallery and has a website called uh, Thursdays. Uh, .nz. So if you want to check that out, um, that's Thursdays in the day with an S. Uh, also, as co-host, uh, some of you might know, my um, our art director of lunch, uh, Shane Evans, out of Evans Yay! on Facebook. <laughs> out of Evans on Facebook and on Instagram. So thank you for joining us. And uh, without further ado, please, uh, Mr. Cranberg, introduce yourself so people know who you are. Okay. First and foremost, um, I've got to say you did very well on, on getting me live on a phone and asking me and requesting me if I would do this because I've never done this and sort of I'm quite a low-key person and I keep things quite private. So I think you've done really well, A, to sort of get me to talk online and yeah. um, if I ever see you in the streets and you're trying to cross the road, I will make a, try and make an A-line to try and run you over. <laughs> in a night way, all right, because that was you've done so well, and you caught me at a vulnerable bit last time when you rang me last week, and, and I said yes because I was in the middle of doing umpteen things, and so you've done very well. I, I must applaud you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, you you did say the topic was art and censorship, but I think it might be a good idea if it's okay with you guys just to really kick off my background and yeah. talk about the journey of going from where I started in London to, to New Zealand, beautiful New Zealand. And um, uh, occasionally jump in there if you've got something you want to ask or if I'm just being too slow. But from the age, I don't know how many of you can remember what, what where you, if you can remember when you were five, what school you went to or, or, or how you felt. And I that was a time for me, the age of five, I remember living in London in a very posh area called Kensington and going to school at the age of five and being very aware of my surroundings. And um, come seven, eight, uh, seven, going to the same school and being allowed to walk the streets by myself there and back, which was quite a quite a journey, and uh, I think you tend to fantasize, dream on your way to make it interesting for yourself. And um, really, that my life up to about the age of seven was like anybody else's, a bit humdrum, family-ish orientated, and really just was, I suppose, living the day every day, whatever the school routine may be, or with family. Come 17, it was the 60s, and my where we lived was, um, you may have heard of Cynthia Lennon, which was John Lennon's ex-wife. She lived around the corner from us, and she had a three-year-old son called Julian. And my parents, being the 60s type family they are, they would go to parties. And I was never understood. And I never knew who this person was. And they just came in and out of our lives. She would go, my parents would go to parties. And I suppose that was my first introduction to someone who was a bit of a celebrity. And uh, she had divorced by then. And it was just, I suppose, an incident in my life, which I never knew who the person was until later on when you look back in your life and you think, hey, that was so, 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 so. And that was quite fascinating for me. Um, it wasn't until 17 again that at school I joined a school band and very much music was in my sphere 
of influence and people like I'm, I may mention to you, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, Led Zeppelin, um, Cream, Canned Heat, Procol Harlem, Deep Purple. But there was one band that actually at the time sort of like um, The Who with um, an album cover, and we're talking a bit about censorship, and the album cover really stood out for me, and it was the four of them in the band pissing against a piece of concrete, and it was called uh, Who's Next? And there was this lovely song, or rather one of the many songs that they had. I'm just going to play the – it was my first introduction to, um, uh, if you like, computer music. And I'm just going to – just see if you can hear this uh, just on the background. And you may know what it is. Can you hear that? It's <laughs> it just encapsulated for me what was going on with Muhammad Ali, Vietnam War, mm. um, the hippie movement where youth was rebellious. Yeah. And that was... Something that stood out in my mind. I thought, this is amazing. This, this, this wasn't an uh, um, instrument. It was a computer. And I thought, mm. wow, this is uh, this is really different. And it, I'm, and that's those those times made music fit in with political things, if you like, and what was going on in the world, the assassinations, the Kennedys, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, all those things didn't make sense, but they were part of my youth. And yeah. it was it, very interesting. From um, from that, in the band, what we were trying to create, we were doing lots of rehearsals. And as we went along, we never made money out of it because we always had to pay for the the uh, the PA system. We'd go and do we'd go and do gigs at clubs, in pubs, those sort of places. And we would end up going next door to a recording studio where someone called Sting, uh, who made, who was make out of the police, was making his first album. We never really connected with them too much. They kept themselves to themselves. But it was interesting times of who you overlapped with. And that was really, that was, I suppose, where I was getting at. Um, for those years, they were pretty impressive about your confidence and, and what you could try. And we played at clubs in called the Marquee Club was one particular one in the middle of London. And many times we'd be sort of threatened to, um, because we were slight to trying to be quite different, uh, you'd be in pubs, they'd say, get out of here and whatever. So it doesn't... It doesn't mean to say you were fantastic or, or, or whatever, but it just came, made you aware of public awareness as well. We did do the support for one band called ACDC, which personally I, I, is not my type of music. And boy, were they really, really loud in a small club too. Mm. Um, fascinating. And they were very, very straight. I mean, they were... Um, you know, the epitome of you, you think nowadays, oh, yeah, there's a lot of this sort of smoking and whatever, but they were a very straight band, a very loud band, and very well rehearsed band. So that was interesting times. Come, come around about 19, I could see the end of my musical career because it wasn't making money. And really, you've got to survive, haven't you? So I looked at the BEC and thought, okay, I'd like to be a designer of some sort, didn't know what, and I thought, well, I transitioned from this music thing to the creative area because I still thought it was creative and would be um, working the BBC and become a designer very quickly. And I found that really you, you had to do your, your, your penance, if you like. You had to go and work in different departments. And I worked in probably about three or four departments, set design, graphic design, um, accounts, but I could not get into the graphics department, which is really where what I wanted to do. But it gave me such a wonderful um, adventure of watching how people make programs like Doctor Who, like live programs of, 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 of um, entertainment programs, sport programs, and you got to explore the studio and work with um, 
talented people who could create a set that gave it atmosphere or the telephone, the um, Doctor Who's uh, telephone box was really looking, it looks really crap when you see it and you're standing next to it. But when you see it on a set and how it's lit, it's just, it's just fantastic. And of course you got through to see the Daleks and how the people got in them and all that sort of stuff. So for me, it was a visual delight of working with props, working with set design, working with um, production teams, working on music programs, working on children's programs, religious programs, going to outdoor and doing comedy and doing being part of a team. That was really what it was about, working as a team in a creative environment. That was, that was fascinating. And for six years, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But because my, in the back of my head, I still wanted to be a designer, a graphic designer, and I could almost got there, but at the end of the day, they said you have to be qualified because it's, a, it's an institution. The BBC is an institution, so you need to have those certain qualities to go up to the next level. I, I saved up the money in those six years and paid for myself to go to art school, and I went to Kingston University and also Chelsea School of Art. Now, Chelsea School of Art was in the middle of, of London. It was when the six, uh, Sex Pistols uh, were there, the punk music, um, it was a very vibrant time and I spent three or four years, I think it was four years in total, learning to be a designer. And really what it does, if you like, if you go to an institution, it probably teaches you how to look, to look and see and explore. I was probably not very nice because I went and worked as a graphic student, I went and worked in the part, played painting department, the sculpture department, made videos, and that wasn't part of the criteria. You meant to stay in your box. I couldn't do that. Being a mature, I was a slightly more mature student, so I said, I want to learn that, I want to learn that, I want to learn. I was hungry. I was like a sponge. So um, art school was really, really fun for me. It was watching how people can develop and be different. You saw people fashion icons in the street because the Stones were living there. I'd play football with, with Bob Marley and Brian Ferry on the grass. And I didn't know, uh, I didn't, I don't think you get overwhelmed with it because they're all in the same boat. Brian Ferry went to art school further up north, uh, further up north of London. It was, and Bob Marley was a bloody good footballer too because he was smoking all the time. I just don't know how he managed it because he was thinking of a bad chest, but he just, he just ran around. But it was just you accepted for everything you're doing because you were in a creative environment. So that's that's where I uh, was for four years. But of course, TV engines gave me jobs on the holidays and and in in downtimes. And uh, um, I just went. I, and then I just when I came out of art school, I think I didn't want to leave because I think it was just an environment jo enjoyment of a playful place. But I got my BA, time to move on. Um, I worked in advertising for a while and learned things about the advertising medium, which I wasn't really enthused about. I worked in publishing with Penguin Books and I also worked in various design studios. By then, I was married and had two little babies and my wife's father had been doing a film here called Came a Hot Friday with Billy T. Jones. Yeah. And he, he was here for about six or seven months doing the film, and he came back to London and said, do you know what? I've had an amazing time in New Zealand. Would you all like to come? Of course, I didn't know anything about New Zealand. I didn't even know where it was, but it sounded bloody fantastic. So um, at 1987, the two babies, we with very little money at the time, we said, let's do it as an adventure. I have never looked back. Uh, my children, my two boys have grown up and they're in their 30s now. They're both living in England. My ex-wife, she's living back in England and she was the Kiwi. I was the Pom and I'm the one that stayed here. So um, so that's that's how I got here and got my job with TVNZ. And, of course, working for TVNZ, uh, it linked in with the BBC, but they didn't make many programmes here. I think there was Kaleidoscope, Koha, live news, and I was used to working in live in live 
situations and they didn't produce anything at the, that time they didn't produce um shorten street or anything like that so there was nothing i could really work on so i got really frustrated for a year and then thought i'll try education and i walked across the road in auckland to aut and because i had a ba i was able to go in there and and uh, teach students about communication and graphic design and of course at that time, in 85 to 87, the whole educational system was changing because it was going digital. We didn't have the traditional ways of doing hand setting of, of typography and whatever. We were now doing them on what something they call desktop publishing, which I hated the term, desktop publishing. Um, and technology was changing. People were um, having to move out of the uh, uh, systems that had there. And it was changing for the agencies. It was changing for design studios. And the technology in the universities and, and AUT places were the places where they changed first. I got a grant. I got a grant to go to Ohio University, the supercomputer center of the world for animation, and um, to, to research in what they did. I did spent there a, a month, and then I went on to England and researched all the new companies that were dealing with digital type work and animation and Ohio University asked me if I'd like to do an MA there. Mm. I turned them down because I felt I, 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 I missed New Zealand quite honestly. I, I stayed, I, so I didn't take the job up, came back to New Zealand, got on with AUT and we wrote a, 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 we wrote a document that would get us funding to be the first polytechnic, if you like, or university to get desktop publishing, to get um, the whole computer system in. And after I did that, I got asked if I'd go and work for an architect's company who was doing and setting up computer animation. And we started doing projects for TV. We started doing projects for Fisher and Paykel, which was a, a very a whiteware range that's in New Zealand and you get a video of <laughs> a three-dimensional how the mechanics work when you bought your own machine which is pretty strange <laughs> so um that's that's where um that's my career in, in 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 where I got and of course I went and taught in other places like uh in in New Zealand uh in Hamilton Wintech and also Unitech and I got headhunted, got headhunted for Northland Tech, Northland um, Polytechnic, which is where we are in, in Northland here, and spent five years there. And then I decided that it would be a good, good time to, because there was an, a lack of design studios in Wangarei, Northland, I set up a design studio, and that went really well. It went too well too quickly, actually, and it was quite exhausting because... Um, I only had about a handful of staff, so I started taking students from North Tech and whatever. But it was it was a journey. It's a journey. Um, that's that's me in a nutshell. And this is, I suppose, now I'm I'm working in the area presently in interior design and in in, in 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 still do corporate branding design. But I also am passionate about the arts. And I've set up a gallery several times, but this time I'm doing it differently again. And it's about really sh finding fresh faces and I have a passion for art. I have a real passion of what where art can go and it's limitless. Um, and um, that's that's where I am today. I mean, what what's interesting for me that um, um, I'm always looking on the internet for things which are different and, and exciting. And there's a, there's a, I invite you to look at a, um, a website called unit, U N I T London.com to have a look at what I call um, interesting artists, which are pushing the boundaries and they're exploring gender. They're exploring the um, uh, sexual eroticism, if, eroticism, if you like and contemporary iconic iconics and i just feel there's some stuff there which we don't see here but it's pushing art to a level that is 
it makes you think. And I'm just going to write these. I'm just going to hold these up if you can see them, if you mm -hmm. can see their names. Those, those people there, we're having a look at their work, what they're doing. Okay? Excellent. We've got um, in the chat, we've got the um, I've typed in the name there so people will be able to get to the link quite easily. Okay. Cheers. Oh. Okay, so 1960s. Let's drop to 1960s because we're talking about um, the sexual revolution in the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, at the, you know, probably the, I mean, all the bands that you named, I listened to when I grew up because my dad was into them. Uh, uh. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he had the albums. <laughs> In the house, uh, I wasn't big into ACDC, Iron Maiden. He's he's a palm himself, so you know he had those albums. He had Deep Purple, he had Cream. You know, Smoke in the Water was one of my jams. Uh, oh yeah, you know, yeah. Purple Haze. Uh, yeah, you Jimmy. know, uh, it's uh, you know, and uh, I enjoyed Deep Purple quite a lot. I think the music and the lyrics they wrote was amazing, and that's I think that's that's the thing. Uh, um, Art has a way to draw a a a universe inside your head, right? Uh, and um, and um, and artists have a way of bringing that universe onto paper, onto uh, yeah. onto lyrics, into the music form, and because they, mm. you know, if you're a musician, you're hearing the dun, 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 in your head, and you're going, now let's try that on the guitar. Let's see if that works. And same thing with you know, with, if you're an artist, you as you know, you've got a canvas that's blank, and you you know you're trying to put color to it, something that you're seeing in your head. One thing I find interesting um, about the '60s was that they were just trying anything and everything, and mm. uh, so, and pushing as many um, you know pushing back against their parents of from the '50s and the '40s after the war, and you know the. I guess the rebellion, you know, uh, rebel without a cause, and um, kind of seems reminds me of now. It's like lots of re rebel, but no causes. It's just There's just no rebelling causes, for the sake of There's some rebel going on. That's right. I mean, Simon and Garfunkel, Sinatra, Beatles, Elvis, all those people were just being pushed behind as these Jimi Hendrixes, the the Led Zeppelins, the Doors, the Cream were coming through, and that was radical to our parents. They, they, my my father hated me singing. Um, a Who song because it had a stutter in it. He said, "You don't have to yeah. sing that. Why don't you fade away?" And my father yeah. said, "Don't do that. What you have, yeah. you know, it's just he couldn't understand it. Bless him." Um, but we, we wanted to go. My dad was like that with one of um, a Metallica song back in the eighties. You know, with the Metallica music back in the eighties. Now it's pop, <laughs> popular music, right? You could probably hear it on the radio now. And it's, it's, that's the way things turn. I think the idea is that people, uh, each generation, you know, blames the one before, right? The, as yep. the song goes. Yeah. And, uh, and I think at the moment, uh, one thing, I mean, this, this current past week, there's been, um, I mean, the last two weeks, there's been a whole push against the art of manga. I'm not sure how well you know about manga and, um, and the literature no. form out of Japan. Um, I'm so, familiar with it. Yep. Because we're so close to Australia, uh, you know, whatever they try to do there usually ends up being here because we kind of seem like New Zealand seems to be like the uh, the wastebasket of the world, you know, everything, or the melting pot. Not melting, the pot. Basket, the melting pot. Melting pot. Yeah, and we seem to get everybody's um, likes and dislikes and we regurgitate our own styles and we go, this is what we actually think of what you have, you know. Yeah. Uh, we get uh, we get the hip hop, we get the pop pop music with the metal, and we give back and go. This is you know alien weaponry. This yes. is she had. Yeah, you had Metallica. No, you had alien weaponry are so that. unique. They are so unique, and they're they're the ones that are going to make it more than some of the others. I feel. And I think that's the, that's the thing. It's like you got young kids again pushing something that's uh, different and very culturally ours. You know, you can say, well, this is New Zealand. This is New Zealand music because it doesn't like uh, doesn't try to be anything but good, you know, well made music and uh, and the way they've done it. I mean, of course, there's a good producer behind it from Shehead, you know, yeah. uh, making yeah. sure it yeah. works. Just like Bob Rock with Motley Crue and Metallica back in the eighties, yeah, and nineties. Yeah. Tell me, um, when when you were at school and um, 
No, let's see, it was Chelsea. Chelsea, right, when, yeah. you were, when you were at Chelsea, there was this, um, this thing when you're in that little bubble of art school where you, uh, you know, you're able to uh, have everybody the same mind. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. They have the same sort of uh, credits they got to get. They have the same work uh, projects they got to do. And you have ones that will just do the stay in that straight line and carry on doing that. But you, you remind my, me of myself because, I mean, or the other way around, where you want to learn as much as possible. I remember going to film school and I was like, I want to learn Photoshop. I want to learn yeah. this. I want to see the, how the lighting works. And they're like, yeah. yeah, you don't have to. You just got to do this little, you know, tick off these boxes. I was like, no, I need to learn. Mm. And I think um, people who actually do that actually get, uh, have a better, happier life and more productive thing by learning more than just sticking that little line. And I mean, I look at, um, um, Shane probably wants to put something in here and I, um, talk about, you know, because you were, you taught him. And uh, and uh, he's talked about um, about mm -hmm. him, you inspiring him at art school. So why don't I just before going further on, bring in um, Shane here to come and talk about you know being at school under you, and um, hopefully it won't be too embarrassing. But don't get personal. <laughs> I got a car. I can run you over <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, I I wasn't even going to talk about it actually. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you about the, the schooling in the 60s. Oh. I was just thinking, um, all the people that you're talking about, they're all quite creative people. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, compared to what we would have had in New Zealand at the same time. Yeah, what was going on then? You, I think you benefited from having a um, being surrounded by a more creative bunch. Do you think that would have been true? Like, it was a very diverse group of people all putting into something and still getting, and it was a real, it was, you know, Tam, think of Tamla Motown and uh, the, the wonderful creative people in that. Then you've got the, the rock music. There was no country and Western as I knew it as it is now, but just think how different and diverse those are. Or even like um, directors, Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, Alfred Hitchcock, Stanley Krubik, who did the Spartacus. Look mm. how edgy those characters. That was like working around other people like that. Yes, at art school, you can still have very straightforward, conservative um, little illustrators that just don't squeak. They just don't. Eat, they just do their own little thing. But mm. there was this other area of of all pitching in and doing different ideas and painters and sculptors and, and uh, that sort of stuff going on and filmmakers all yeah. learning the trade. Mm. It's, so, it's, and then you had this musical thing outside going on. As, as a Kiwi, you know, growing up in a small town, when you hear that people used to play soccer with Bob Marley while recording music in the same area as Sting, you're just sitting here going... Mm. Well, we must sell on a lot of stuff. <laughs> it just, you, must have had, I, uh, you must have had some. Uh, did you, you must have the pop culture here, did you not? When you were your parents, they had a pop culture of some sort. Or was I it grew up farming parents? So right, yeah. I suppose I mean, that's I the difference of being in a central London city. Motorbikes and tractors. I was good. <laughs> and and there's some really interesting. That there's some. And I think there's some really natural sports type people who do who can do that and are good at what at what they do. It's just what's your background? Is it in farming? Is it in this, in that? And therefore, I've become a rural country person living in New Zealand to a what was once a, a concrete jungle type guy who walk in the streets. I, I am, I'm actually more comfortable now living in the country in in New Zealand and enjoying it. But that's because I've moved. Uh, I've changed. I mean, it would drive me nuts if I lived here at, tw at the age of twenty-five, probably, because there would be. I'd find it unstimulating. But I'm not. I'm not n knocking that. It's just um, I've often thought if I came here when in my teens, what would it have been like for me? I was very fortunate to be in central London, go to the right art schools, which were in, where things were happening, and I was very, very fortunate. And I. And I. I. I mean, that can be for anybody. Any, It's just about where do we go? I still don't know where my journey is, 
I just know I keep on the path of creativity and don't diverse too much away from it and things happen. And I think that's what's wonderful about believing in your own creativity. You've got to have faith in what you do. And, yeah. and do, you um, think that, um, do you think that if you were, like you said, if you were 25 in Whangarei and you couldn't find things to stimulate yourself, do you think you would have made your own stimulation? Do you think you would have found people like yourself? I would have thought you would have to find like-minded people and try and start something up. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's so you always had to a bit of help. Um, carry on, go on. I mean, I listened to, I listened yesterday to Oliver Oliver Stone on an interview about his book Chasing the Light. Um and it was interesting listening to him because what he's done is, is been amazing and what he's achieved in his life. You don't have to like what he's done, but it's um, how far do you take what you do? You know, let's look at um, censorship. He never worried about censorship. In all the things he did, he was really quite raw to the bone of, of American society. But he was telling the truth from his perspective. You know, he didn't like war. He did. He wasn't. He had. He did it he, um, um, at, at, just to find out probably how awful it was. And he doesn't. He doesn't um, praise and, and what you call the word glorify war. It isn't. It isn't a great thing. Um, the think- same with art. You do not have to be gruesome and 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 over the top to do something good. You can actually just feel very. Um, uh, what's the word? You can feel very secure in what you do, but do it well without having to create chaos. I mean, yeah. there's people that do like creating chaos in the world, but you don't need to do it. You just need to do your art and think about it. And if you do it good enough and well enough, someone else will. It will make someone else think and go, "Yeah, art has an amazing tool to to make people think and change their perspective." No matter what type of art it may be, and that's I think that's, um, I think a lot of um, what we have a lot of time is like people think destruction is uh, is the way to go rather than building up with with art. So like let's destroy everything and then we can build up rather mm. than um, actually building as you go. And um, I think the, um, the like the sixties because of what it was. I mean it's very um, you know very very close to what we're going through right now around the world, um, you know, where people just, uh, whereas in the 50s it was a throwback and saying, hey, look, we don't want, uh, you know, we don't want wars, we don't want this, okay, we're not going to start destroying stuff, you know, but we're just going to do our own thing and we're going to play music loud, we're going to have our own fashion sense, we're going to do new artwork. Uh, silly as it is, Andy Warhol comes to mind, you know, ripping mm. off uh, comic yep. books. Uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah. yep. you know, and, and and the whole idea where in the fifties they're burning comic books because of uh, um, burning, um, banning uh, what was kids were having access to in the medium of comic books like horror and stuff, and you had um, you know trying to ban that, but also you've got art, actual art, people trying to ban actual art, and um, how did you you know did you ever run into that with us? Uh, people that you went to school with where they had art at art school where the, you know, people were going, well, uh, teachers were going or uh, the mistresses were whatever, headmasters were going, well, no, you can't have this on display. Go do something else. You know, you might upset someone. Let's, let's just look at a very simple thing. At art school then, you did life drawing. So you had someone came in nude to do life drawing and that was an appreciation of how you well you see. In art schools here, we don't even have a, a life drawing. Whether it's a still life, we we don't have the nude model, and that's 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 important to, to learn about the basics as well. Um, I can't really? think of anything. I made move. I made films, and I can't think at art school. And nothing was no go. Was let's explore, let's see, because mm. you're going to learn through this, and you're going to learn to make mistakes too. Mm. So. It's you don't have to be that um, that uh, 
destroying type feel. And, and I think when I think of the punk stage of music, the appreciation of a punk musician was to spit at them. And that was a scene as a form of approval. That's fine if that's what that what that was for a while. Um, with the Clash, Iggy Pop, Patti Smith, The Dolls, Stranglers, um, Sushi and the Banshees and The Jam all had something to say with their music. It doesn't matter if it doesn't last forever and ever and ever. They did it, it they expressed themselves, and that's being creative. And if we did more of that and, and, and believed in what we did instead of sort of trying to be um, put it into tidy little shovels of, of areas um, difference is it I know I know people don't like things that are different you look different you've got diff you dress differently you think differently but that what makes us exciting and interesting and that's what yeah. keeps that can actually create from that something different can can happen and in a positive way I don't believe it's destructive being creative I really don't I think creative is is really using this and working and interacting with other people to come up mm -hmm. with something great and that's what we did when I was an architect, when we did uh, um, 3D work for architecture. Um, it, it all had a positive outcome for the, for the client at the end of the day, no matter what it was, a children's program or, or whether it was um, a piece of architecture for something else. Uh, it's, and, I, and I still believe that today. Those, those artists in Unit London, Helen Beard, she, uh, uh, Alison Zuckerman, Ode level have all got a unique ways of, of of expressing their art in a in a humorous way, in a gentle way, but also mm. it's how the viewer, it's at the end of the day how the viewer sees it. And it's mm. up to them. They don't if they don't like it, they don't have to go and look at it. If they don't hear like what's on the radio, they can turn it off. It's up to mm. us at the end of the day. We shouldn't ever be negative about anything. We should be pretty positive. We can say we don't like something. That's that's fine. That's okay. That's, it might be too much for us to handle. It's yeah. just like a drink. I don't like that drink. I won't drink that again. It's uh, my yeah. taste buds have changed since I was a kid. I hated alcohol when I was a kid. I liked it at, in the twenties. Now I'm not so keen on it. I have particular taste. My taste buds have changed. That's great. That's wonderful. It made me make make me live longer. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, you mentioned that there was like, um, there's no more nude models in art schools. When did that come about? Because I know when I, uh, when I was at Polytech, uh, you know, at North Tech in 94, mm. uh, 95, I think they still had them. So when did they right. cancel them? Yeah. 94. I haven't seen that around for many years now in other places. It's just not part of the curriculum. But it, it, it might, it might be, be in a, an independent school. It might be in an, um, an independent art school, but not in the in the, the government structured ones. That seems to be the most weirdest, strangest things to actually um, have not happen. Because I mean, when you're going to art school, you're an adult, right? You're considered to be an adult. You you're not at high school anymore. You're not a molly yeah. molly coddled under your, you know sort of uh, a child. You know, yep. and I'm very, you know, I'm very serious when I say child and I say adult because there's there's a barrier there. So when you're at art school, you basically are getting paid, or you're paying to be learning how to do art, and you're, that you're comes it, so the you next world. Right. I, I think yeah. if I hadn't, if I'd gone when I was 18, and I went at 23, I didn't find the human body. I would have giggled probably if I was 18. Probably would have because it would have been a bit. I was a bit embarrassed, but at the age of 23, I thought, this is good. This is how I, I, I'm using my eyes to look at how the body is performed and how you draw it. To draw a curve with a pencil line is not the easiest to, to do. <laughs> this boy Evans does it, does it very well, and, for, and he can do it from fantasy. He, he's, he's, he's learned the trade. But uh, proportions, um, how to see a line, how to see a, a figure in shade, it's just... Once you, once you can, not everyone can draw nowadays, and, and artists don't seem to be able to draw a lot more. Um, I had to do it once for, for my family to show them I could draw a cow because I was doing a lot of abstraction. And when they saw that, they said, oh, Richard, you can draw. I said, yes, I just don't choose to. Interesting, you know. So, yeah, at times, um, times it, may, it might come back in 10 years' time of, of, of life drawing. I don't know. 
I don't know what. Um, but I, um, I, I, wonder, I wonder if it's because of the safe space thing that everybody's talking about, where you know it, it, people get triggered if they see nudity or if they see some, you know, uh, a bulge or something on a guy or you know, or, or the male genital or the female genital, and you know, it triggers someone some weird way. Is it? I, I feel like we've become so multicultural in that in that environment we live in now in this culture that uh, we 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 look for places to be where we won't be triggered anymore, and therefore nobody else should be either, right? Yeah, so it so it one, down. Person, one person's upset by seeing a nude model in a art class to learn how to do life drawing. Therefore, nobody else is allowed it either, and yeah. to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and it, it's kind of it seems to be going very regressive to me, not progressive at all in these sort of things. Mm. Mm. I, I'm 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 just thinking of super. I'm moving ahead from a superhero American lo um, ca characters. The stories are so numb. There's no real innovativeness. That's why we need some new characters created. And to do a philosophy of good of good or interesting things, but all the supernatural stuff in superheroes is is so over the top and over made now. It's 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 you're getting there for more of the effects than actually what the character is about and what that yeah. his or her belief is about. Let's have some modern thinking in some of these new characters of saying this woman can do this and she's good at this and and um, wow she's. She's got a good head on her shoulders, you know. Um, think, uh, when, it, when it comes to superheroes, what's happened is uh, about 10 years ago, they had an influx of new people that never knew anything about working in the industry. They um, So it all came to a stop. And what right. they did was they, they regurgitated. This is like just at the at the fullness and the, the amazing, uh, you know, setup of the Iron Man movie. Just when everybody was into it, they came in and decided we're going to throw it all out, all the good stuff, and bring in all this whatever else. And what happened was that a lot of people came in that didn't even know how to write comic books. They came in from mm -hmm. advertising, from writing web, web uh, website articles. And so you had all these people come in. And even I don't read comics anymore, right? I, I have collections. I don't even read because, like I said, it's numbing. It's There's no it's innovation. There's no um, new stories. Yeah. And because... This, it's like uh, the same old, same old, just, you know, uh, well, it reminds same, me of... The, same the, the, if, you, if you found a superhero character that could go and save Hong Kong, and there were three of them or four of them, to do something positive for Hong Kong, and they're super characters, but they've got great philosophies behind them, wouldn't that be a new series of characters? Boom! Yeah. Go out and solve well, the world, you know? They did that with... Um, um, at the height of um, Superman about 10 years ago with Iran. Oh, really? And so, yeah. And, oh. um, yeah. And it was a, it was a part of, uh, part of a um, anthology of stories about celebration. I think it was about 75 years of Superman or something like that, or 70 right. years of Superman. And what had happened was uh, straight after that is when we went downhill. Ah. The whole, you know. Okay. Yeah. And okay. so that's why we have all this, the last 10 years of, um, mind-numbing yeah. stories that people that actually read don't read anymore, and that's yeah. why mangoes become a, such a big popular thing. Because if you want stuff like we we're just talking about with Hong Kong, you go to manga. You right, go to manga, okay. and manga and you have that happen. Um, right, okay. I would like to keep my eyes out for that. Yeah. Um, um, Shane was telling me early, earlier about picking up some books um, about some. Interesting, um, you know, artwork that it, he had like uh, Tim Sale's book uh, and Jeff Lowe's book from about maybe about 15 years ago. And it's just, uh, do you want to hold it up, Shane? Have you got it in your hand? Just the amazing, um, and these guys, especially Tim Sale, doesn't do, um, doesn't do that many comics, but when he does, wow. you know, he works with mostly with Jeff Loeb and they do big 12 issue comic series. And just really you know, nice. this is one where they've taken all the color out. Yeah, this is twenty. This is fifteen years back when they were writing about mm -hmm. the really good stories of Superman and Batman, and even with the Avengers, where there were really, really good stories. And you go pick it up and go, oh, they're talking about domestic violence in this one. Yeah, right. yeah, 
Yeah. There was, um, you know, one of my favorite books is from The Ultimates, um, which is done by Mark Miller of uh, Kingsman and Kick Ass. Kingsman, and oh, he, yeah. Um, know that. And, yep. and he talks about um, Captain America going and kicking a uh, giant man's butt for being a domestic abuser. <laughs> that whole story is basically about that. And that was about 15 years ago. Yeah. Now we just have yeah. like, who's the next alien to fight? You know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's. Um, I think uh, let's get back to censorship with art. I think because you um, because of the 60s, and we're talking about how the, the freedom movement, freedom. Uh, and one thing that really um, interests me a lot is uh, about the whole area of sexual revolution in the 60s. Uh, now we have so much um, alienation around mm. around adults. Especially around mature adults and sex, and uh, you know, and sexuality, uh, where it's like they're fighting over genders, they're fighting over uh, such and such said this, such and said that's not like this. You can't tell that joke because you shouldn't. You're yeah. not a male or you're female. You shouldn't be telling the joke, or you mm. can't do this. And mm. and it's gotten to a point where I think, silly as it might sound, I think we need another sexual revolution for adults in their head. You know, to just go throw. Throw this all away and look. Let's get let's get some new innovative music going. Let's get some more innovative art going, and because we seem to be going around, and you know, in circles over the we same very issues. PC circle. And yeah. if you notice, in, if you work with, if you go to meetings with people, um, there's a lot less touching. It's not seen to say goodbye and tap someone on the shoulder. Male yeah. or female, it's not the seen thing to do. Shaking hands is about it. But if you agree with someone and or a female that you in the meeting and you tap their shoulder, that's not seen as we can do that anymore. And that's that's a yeah. shame because you know a lot of people work online, and when you go and meet someone eye to eye, it's that interaction which is very yeah. important to express how you're feeling and what you're doing and what the nature of this meeting is all about. So. Um, I, I totally agree with you. We've we've lost the plot a bit, and in um, comedy, comedy, you're not. A, there's a lot less uh, common com comedians who are. I know a few which are have, have got that side of them, and they can say what they like, and they get away with it. But there's uh, there's quite a few now that are so PC they won't even talk about another culture. You know, mm. so. Um, I find that very sad because we've got to be able to laugh at ourselves mm. and to la and laugh with others. I mean, uh, Billy T. James was a great Billy T. Oh. James was a person that could laugh at himself um, yep. and take the Mickey out of himself. And I, and I know that's not that's not um, proper anymore, which is a bit of a shame because yeah. he, he, I, I can I connected with it when when I was when I first came back when I first came here in '85. Yeah, Billy was Billy was amazing. I mean, I've got his old um, live um, DVDs here and a couple of the comic books based yeah. on his work. I think um, imagine him like I, I mentioned this before. I cannot imagine Billy surviving in this climate. Mm, you know, no, and no. he's one of our legends. And no. I don't see him as a as a as a comedian and as a film uh, producer and actor no. actually surviving in this environment. No. A down-to-earth guy who just wanted to be funny, and he did it in his own way. He found his own way of being funny. Trying to be someone else is not easy. It's exhausting, I'm sure. Trying to do something else, what someone else wants, is not easy. It's twice as hard. Do what you do, and it becomes a lot simpler, and it flows. The, the, the creativity will flow out of you too. So it's just to come up with something unique. That's the part, part to tell you something I want to say with my art. Once you've got yeah. that, you could probably run off 10 of 10 different ideas once you've got that idea and have that faith that you can do it, you know? It's almost like we need a big production team in, in Northland. That, yeah. You know, to the come up thing was like is, um, uh, anyway. you, said you, worked, you said you worked in animation as well as we get, carry on to the next one. Uh, how long did you work in animation? Well, we, we bought a package called Neo Visuals, which was the next one down from Wavefront, which was a big animation package, which from America was worth a lot of money. So we did architectural renderings and we did um, opening title sequences at, at the architect's place. And 
we found we were at the beginning. You know, sometimes when you at the beginning of something, then no one else is doing it. It's bloody hard. It's twice as expensive and no one wants it. Um, we were at that stage and it was really hard. We were, we were trying to talk to um, other architect companies, other companies that visualize in the print industry. There was um, using 3D low logos. No one wanted it at that point. And then suddenly about five years later, once AutoCAD had become yeah. familiar with certain software add-ons, Every architect was doing a visualization of a room and putting furniture in it, and it could look pretty cool. But it was the low end, and we were doing it from the top end because we were we were inspired by American um, animators and who were using Wavefront for film production, and we were just yeah. ahead of our game about five years. So we 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 had to two of us had to come out of this architect company because uh, we made a go of it for five years to survive, but then it, we couldn't get it to go anywhere else. So it was hard work, but you know, when you every day you're enthusiastic about animation and ti opening title sequences with lettering and levels of sophistication of um, ray tracing and stuff like that, it was sexy, but it, it still was such an early market and yet other areas were more mature than us, like in Europe was more mature and so was America because it came from there. But um, so it was, it was really exciting. It was like on the edge stuff, um, but we just couldn't take it any further. Now, as you say, it's the low end. A lot of architects can do that and do visualizations. And you can, and obviously, people, you can create animated characters in 3D and stuff like that, which is a lot easier. Did so you that, actually, uh, did you do any animated characters? Uh, no, no, it, was, it wasn't called for. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an open market for that now, obviously. Yeah. Um, take the, the line drawings and then, then produce them. But, uh, there's a lot of potential for that. I still feel yep. there's potential of, of having the philosophy of the right type of feeling of the message you want to get across, that there's, there's, it's there. Because you've got a, a market, a younger market, who are, who are accepting that. They're, mm -hmm. they're taking it on, from, especially from, your, as you say, the, the uh, Japanese and your Asian markets too. Yeah. yeah and, there's, and there's some amazing characters who, who create stuff over there too. Very slick. Very slick drawers, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, because the reason I asked about that is because I'm thinking that maybe we could do with an animation school in Whangarei, you know, in Northland, because I think um, it's uh, it's something that we could produce ourselves and make, you know, short films and feature length yep. films ourselves rather yep. than having to take everybody else's, you know, um, being able to tell our own stories through it. Do, just do your own and do your own ideas with Kiwi ideas, Northland ideas, because Northland is so different from the South Island again, or even Auckland. You yeah. can have the sort of um, what's that 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 uh, sweet the the, the uh, oh, I've forgotten now, but you can certainly create your own feel of Northland characters, like the Tanifa. It could be a yeah. character, a man character, which looks like the Tanifa, but it's it's a Northland character and it has Northland philosophies. Of, of um, cultures too, so you could just start working with that. Probably have to clear it with the um, the copyright tape people, and that's it. But if you did a fantastic well, animation of that, of that that's idea, the other thing. yeah, that's the other thing. It's a good thing that you mentioned that. See, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned how like having a Europe, um, playing a Europe, um, sorry, a a white character, let's just say, right, a European white character in a game, I find very cool and very relaxing. I have no, no, nothing to worry about. Just a character, I'm going in. Whatever character is playing, I'm keen with that. The moment the character changes to some uh, ethnic group, then I kind of go, well, all right, so what's his ideology? What's his, yeah. Where is he from? What's, you know, why is he like this? Why does, yeah. whenever he picks up this thing or that, there's all this cultural baggage suddenly added to it. And, well, um, yeah. But, but I find that when when I just have a just a you know a blank character, even though, and I'm you know I want to be very clear here, even though Europeans have so many different character um, cultures, so many things, ethnicities part of them, so many different countries they come from, but there and even though there's baggage there, I find that if there is in their game that I'm playing, I don't have to worry about all that. Yet, <laughs> yet the moment. 
uh, you know, I say a brown character like myself to edit, suddenly I'm like, all right, so everything is like now I got to tick off a point. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Maybe if he does wow. this, it's because of this. And I find that very, um, I, I feel like a chip on my shoulder when I'm playing as someone my own. Okay. Well, I get like, that. I get that. Now yeah. take the scenario of what you think a typical Asian is or a typical Fijian or a typical mm. Indian person from my background or a New Zealander. Yeah. But then put them in Wangarei and we see we've got Indians, we've got, we've got Fijians here, we've got uh, characters from other countries. They take on a bit of New Zealand, uh, they take on a bit of Northland, don't they? Yeah. You know, an Asian talking with a Kiwi accent is most most funny. It's really lovely. It's clearly quite yeah. colourful. It's lovely. But if you say their mannerisms, they've lost some of that past culture they did yeah. in their DNA. It's still there, but they become a Northlander. And that's yeah. where that's where they really focus on the character, you know, mm -hmm. of, of how they speak maybe or what they think because they're thinking differently to what they would have done if they were back in, in their culture, in their home, in their, in their yeah. original land. I think that's, that's the difference now. We've got someone who's come from Fiji, lives here, and is doing yeah. the key thing. That's where yeah. we've got to find the, the, the things. Oh, we've got an yeah, addition. But... Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> the same Copy. here. And it's just it's like, um, what was it? The Famous Five had a dog or something. Or, or, or it, in there, that dog had a character, or there's Felix the dog, or whatever there is in yeah. these character paints in the past. People have mm. created animals as, as characters too. Um, yeah, you had Lassie and you had um, um, Hobo. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had Lassie and um, something Hobo, the littlest Hobo. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, um, so, I mean, we've done it with characters of animals because mm. we can almost put a personality in them. But we can do that with, I think, nationalities without being derogative. Uh, yeah. in, uh, in, I know Homer, in that Homer Sis, Sis, Simpsons, the guy who played an Indian wasn't an Indian, was he? He was a, an actor. Yeah. So they got rid of him. Uh, you yeah. know? Which, are, which yeah. I find very sad. Because very sad I, indeed. Yeah. Very sad. On, the one end, on the one end, I go, well, yeah, they could have got it. And then I was like, then I was like but it's an acting. Yeah. <laughs> He's acting. Exactly. He's acting. That's right. Yeah. So and I think I'm that's the, there's a psychology in all this, and I, that's where it needs to be nutted out. The character. What is this character like? What does this character believe in? And once you get those pers those things out, the personality of the person comes out. That's when you feel, I I can relate to that actor in that film. I can relate to that person in that film because they played it so well. They've done their research on that person. Yeah, that's and, that's, and that's what comes down to merit. I think merit-based uh, merit based market or merit-based anything, right, is more, you know, it's, it's what's, what makes things work. If you, if you go on about uh, diversity or ethnicity or gender, then you're losing because yeah. you might not get the top quality work. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, at the end of the day, I think that's going to harm the quality of the work that's going to be produced. Yeah, and look at people who are in their sixty-fives, and they and and they have all this wealth of knowledge, but suddenly they're put on the pile uh, yeah. and called a pensioner. But yet they've still got this knowledge, and they can still do things. May not be as physical as a thirty-year-old or a twenty-five-year-old, but they're going to pay a twenty-five-year-old because that sixty-five-year-old is, is earning that much. It's about mm. balance. It's about really sort of balancing it out. And, and creative people, again, can create this sort of um, uh, putting it out there, putting it out there sort of thing and doing it in their creative way with their characters they create or the stories they tell or the films they make or the illustrations they do or the paintings they say. We can, we can change people's philosophy. I've watched it. people come into my place and it's made them think and they've gone away and thought about it and they've come back. And they told me that made that painting made me think. I like it really. I like it a lot. And then and then you tell them why what was all about the painting, and 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 they actually going they they come back and they buy it because yeah. they can relate to it. 
They didn't know why at first. It was different, you see. It was because it was alien to them, what they were looking at. They didn't know what they were looking at until they made some sense out of it. And that's the same with all, all the things you do creativity-wise, whether it's making a piece of music, creating from scratch, whether a bass line in a piece of music, slow that down and it can actually sound like something else in another piece of music. There's no uniqueness. There is no uniqueness in anything. It's been done before. It's just how we put that with that together yeah. and we can make something different. It's all been done before. And, and that's, that's, you're going to have to rack your brain. It's just you do what you do and then mm. see what difference you can make with because you're unique in what we think, in, in what mm. you're thinking. That's what I think is beautiful about our minds. Okay. I think, I think what's, uh, what's actually causing a lot of rift is the comp competitiveness, isn't it? It's like we've got to compete with everybody else to get to the top. And, well, and so... And so you get a lot of people uh, doing similar art styles, just try to make, you know, try to get that uh, get that contract or so, and they copy each other, uh, or or they try to, um, yeah. I think that's that's where that's what I think is happening is where rather than people being more unique, they're trying to be more uh, similar. But don't and, you think don't you think being unique will make you stand out more than being doing the three that got similar stories with the similar characters. And it's about money at the end of the day. If you say, screw money, but I'm going to do this really well and I'm going to believe in it, it's going to it's going to have a faith of its own every time. Yeah. And people are going to go, it's like your CV. If you do your CV just like it's normally done with a, you know, on, a, on, a, on a computer and whatever, but you actually think about doing your CV front cover or the layout slightly different, You've got a fifty percent chance that they're going to look at that because it's different from all the others. Mm. Just how you approach it each time. Yep. The sense of uniqueness and and um, because yeah, there's there's people chasing the money and then they're all going to do what the client roughly says. But if you do what the client says but add two more things to it, and it's got them thinking, they're going to think I'm getting good value for money here, and this person's done something different to what I was thinking. They can either say yes or no. If they say no, well, that doesn't mean to say you've done a lesser job. It means you've done a bloody good job, but they just didn't like it. So they weren't the right client to work with, were they? <laughs> you know. But if someone says, Jesus, I love that. That is fantastic. I never thought of that. They're going to take you on for that. And I, that's that's the difference. I, I, that's how I believe it because I've, I've seen it happen. Seen Shane it happen. had a situation where uh... – where someone, I think somebody approached him to do something, but they wanted him to do something else, even though they knew his art style. Now, mm. was it? Uh, did you want? Uh, do you want to talk about that, Shane? Or um, I've had that situation several times, so I'm not sure which one you're talking about. <laughs> um, but I mean, the basic thing is, if they see your artwork and they like it, I don't know why they come to you and then suddenly ask you to copy someone else's. Yeah, so I don't my get that. Was, I can do the artwork for you, but it's going to look like my artwork. Yeah. I mean, I can tweak it a wee bit, but I'm not going to change my style because... No, I totally agree. Doing? Stick with your guns. And if they want something else, then maybe they need to go someone else. Or it depends how hard, how much hardship you got that you need the money to do it. And then you're selling your you're selling you're selling your soul, soul boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, I think that relates to the the uh, the whole thing about movies and comics and everything all being the same, because yeah. you like no one wants to offend anyone, no one wants to lose money. They all want to do the safe bet. Yeah. But the strange thing is, in ten or fifteen years, people will not remember the twelve movies that they're all the same. They'll remember yeah. the one that stands out. Wow, that's, they'll, that's, they'll well, remember yeah. the one band that's better. Yeah. You know, they remember David Bowie. They don't remember the other 50 artists that year. Yeah, that's so, very true. So that's that's the music the music scenario of, of an artist is a great – that's a great uh, reference point, actually. Yeah. I can't yeah. think if I look to the next last five years who stood out for me as a new musician, new musician – and I think it's more women than men at the moment who are standing out. I, 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 it's hard because they're not standing out as they used to, like Prince did, you know, Prince. 
Wow. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking in my head before when you're talking about it. I was like, Prince, you know, Boom. you know, all the way back to Purple Rain. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Never that was so strong in there. So you've got a good point there, Shane. Why would you do it for someone if they want you to do it another way? Why? Why? It's not you, is it? It's not authentic. No. I mean, really, they should chase up the person they want. Yeah. If, uh... Yeah. That's right. So. Why would well, you maybe want to it's work? because they, mm. they're hoping that you you charge them less than the people that whose artwork they want. You know, bottom dollar again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can yeah. understand that. But, I mean, they should look at your artwork and realise they are not going to get the other artwork. No. Because if you've been right. learning something for 20 years, mm. you kind of get... I hate to say you get stuck in your ways, but you, you, you pick up styles or techniques that you like. Yeah. That appeal yeah. to you. That's right. That talks to certain you. Line work. Yeah, certain yeah. line work and stuff I do that I like that some other people might not like, but I like mm. it myself. So the, the natural natural gut feeling is to go with what you, what you know and like because it's got to stimulate you first. If you're spending hours doing something, it's – Time goes so quickly when you're doing what you want, you know that, and that's why I love the creative in the creative industry. My days go so quickly; they are full on. I don't have days off; they're seven days a week, and I love it. I love it because I'm doing what I'm wanting to do. I'm not working for someone else telling me how to do it, and I haven't done that for many, many years. I'm very fortunate, very lucky, and I'm not saying that's 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 everyone else should do that. But with it comes to art, you've got to do your own thing in your art. It's really important. It really is. Believe it. It's also, I mean, uh, it's also rewarding, isn't it? Mentally oh. and emotionally, it's rewarding oh. because uh, you're doing what you love doing. And mm. if you're, like I say, if, you, if, you, if you're doing what you love doing, you won't work a day, right? Because no. you, you won't feel like you're working a day. You don't even get illness. You don't even get ill. I noticed when I was working for another company, I was I was getting ill and I was thinking, oh, I don't need this because I was really not wanting to be there. Mm. And I didn't realise that. And I thought, wow, I haven't had a day's off for of sickness for years. Mm. And I paced myself, obviously, to, to work in the, in what I need to do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, and, and that's I, – I can't stress that enough, really. I think it's um, – I'm talking to two very talented people in front of me here and um, – you are exalt. You're, you're you're different. You're different to the norm. So it needs to be thought about. <laughs> how, do, how do I make money out of this next? Yeah. <laughs> that's but that's not. <laughs> which right is which is where, which is a good segue to where I'm taking you now. Which is let's talk about Thursdays, the gallery. Tell us about yeah. that as we finish in the next twenty minutes. Let's talk about that because i don't want to keep you here tonight for too long and also i know do, both of you guys are working because i've just got to go after 10. okay let's make it 10 then yep sounds good to me so let's talk about thursdays and i'll let um i'll let um shane ask the questions in this oh. um, <laughs> and because he's already been there he knows a bit more about it than i do so take it away shane go for it i have no idea what you're leading up to you know <laughs> about the um, gallery yeah, I know the gallery. Uh, <laughs> who, what, why? Yeah, who, what, why, Richard? Why did you set it up? Um, <laughs> because I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say I believe in the arts. It's a tough business up here in Northland. Um, people talk about the creativity of of Northland, but I don't see it massingly coming out and spewing out on the road. I see lots yeah. of little, little thoughts, but no one's really willing to go to the next level and turn it more professional. And I don't know whether that's because they don't believe in themselves or they're struggling and they have to do other things, To and I understand that. So I put a vehicle out there called a gallery. It's, it's really something else as well. To make, see if it can, it, it, I know it's not going to make money, but why do I do it? Because I'm passionate about creativity and it will draw people in who love creativity or like something different or, or bring in people who are creative. And therefore, it's an organism, organism that will 
possibly vibrate with some people and maybe we can, as a, as a group of people, make something happen. Yep. It, all it is is a moment, it's like a light going on and, and, and sort of um, vibrating and trying to unsettle the norm, if you like. It's trying to be something different, but it has to start from something that I'm confident with, and that's traditional art. I'm not a great fan of, a le of, of, of digital art, but I can see it has a place. I'm not keen on – I'm really keen on looking at art and touching art. Um, now let's just see what, the, what people will vibrate around it. And that's, that's, that's really what I'm – it's an experiment. It's an experiment, hmm. yeah. and I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to play with that experiment. Do you find uh, the – because there are a lot of creative people that I know, and they never show their artwork to people. They never bring it forward yeah. and stuff. Do you find that that's a, just a Northland thing or if it's a New Zealand thing? or Because I've met a lot of creative people who are very good at painting, very good at drawing, etc., and right. they never show anyone. What, how can I? How can I bring them out of themselves? Well, yeah, how can I we bring wondering. them out of themselves? Because I think that's important. Yeah, I prefer to see that than someone come to me and say, "I'm fantastic. I got this painting. Can you put it on your walls?" I'd say, "Bugger off!" And I don't mean that nastily, but I prefer to find those people who have got something different, or can they can sing a song so differently that it sounds so different and alien that I want, I want that. That's, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. So you've also got the, uh, the other website. What's that one called again? And what does it do? Is that all Art Northland? Yeah. That one's yeah. about a directory that you put people on, on it who we can sort of be the, what do you call it? as a word, a cable to them. It's like an extending a cable because a lot of people, artists, don't have their own websites. They don't have the where to, to market themselves. But if Art Northern can do it for them by showing them some works in there and it gives them a phone number of the artist, an email address, and hopefully a, a, a one-page website eventually, it's a starting point for those people that have got something, a gift to offer, but they can't market themselves. They don't have the, the where, the know how. So that's what that is. It's like a directory. Yeah. Uh, you've got a few different artists in your gallery, a few different styles. Is there any type of style you wish you could find or wish you could see? Is there any artwork that you've... Uh, you feel like you're missing out on or I think I'm missing out on a lots of a lot of lot of fresh different art um, the, uh, the alternative stuff I um, I've totally I've got at the moment the most traditional I've had fairly traditional stuff but I um, I would say that you you personally have been probably the most edgiest and take and willing to take risks and I find that that's exciting. I find that exciting. So, yeah, yeah. so you're not you're not into you know, still lifes and the landscapes and stuff. You want something. I'm, I'm, I'm over still lives and look landscapes if they look like um, uh, famous artists of the past who keep doing pictures of the heads or um, or, or, or Northland. I, I'm I'm looking for someone who can actually turn the Hartier Hartier River into something amazing. Or, or whatever it can it can be a landscape, but if they if they did have found a way of doing something so different, I, I I'd really look at it. Mm. I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that's a weird thing, isn't it? Being bored, it's uh, <laughs> it's stimulation we need. You see, yeah, it's like. Um, Every time I get bored, I just sit down and start reading books, other right. people's work. Filling your head with good yeah, stuff. Filling my head yeah. with color and good stories stuff. and 
other ways of people doing things that I don't think about doing, reading well, uh, manga or re uh, watching anime because I'm used to be writing comic books. So I got to do the other thing. And I think yeah. a lot of people do that, uh, artists do that as well, because whenever, you know, like you look at hip hop artists, they will listen to classic rock or classic yeah. uh, R&B because it's not what they're making. Same with, mm. I know heavy metal, hardcore heavy metal band music will be listening to Enya, right? Or Clannad, or, uh, yeah. or, uh, yeah. or, you know, Roxy music, yeah. stuff like that, because it's, it, uh, because hearing all the noise all the time of their own work, yeah. deafens them to creativity sometimes. So I think, um, it makes you numb and you go, well, I'm using, listening to the same thing over and over again, and I'm getting bored. And yep. you know, and so having something more uh, div diverse in sound and uh, yep. color can add a bit more to your uh, emotions and uh, enjoyment, and that makes you go, you know what? I should start working now <laughs> on my own I'm, work. I've yeah, got I'm some. Doing, I'm yeah. doing some paintings at the moment for my next exhibition, which is about. It's called Woman. Just simply that in two months, in a month's time. I'm painting like Picasso at the moment because I'm so impressed with Picasso on gold leaf. I'm painting on top of gold leaf on a canvas. Yeah. Never done it before, but it's so exciting doing it. If it doesn't work, it'll be buffed out. If I do another one and it works, it'll be in. But I don't know until I try it, until I read that book and fill my mind up with those ideas. And if I don't try and experiment, then I'm going to be boring to myself. Yeah. So I think we need to look at – some people need more stimulation than others uh, mm. uh, in a creative sense, but um, I just like to be kept alive, and that's why I look at other things overseas and, and, uh, and I, I view them and, and go from there. But reading is fantastic, um, trying styles out, making mistakes, and it's okay. To, uh, this whole canvas is that it, if I make a mistake, that's okay. I paint mm. over it. And there'd be gold leaf as a backdrop to no one will ever know. But that's yeah. that's that's exciting. Yeah, that's I think exciting. it's um, I, I'm like talking about some people need more uh, more um, uh, more input than most people. I need a lot of imp sens a sensory input compared to most people. I need like weeks of it sometimes uh, because I because I'm so hyper you exert so much. And I think a lot of people like that when you exert so much energy, if you don't bring that energy back in, then you're bringing out boring, numb, you know, mindless work that You've nobody really cares about. You've got, to put You've got to put it in. You've got to put it into something so that you can, all that energy, all those ideas can put it into it. Cause you're only here for a certain amount in your life, whether it's 60, 70, 80, so while you're younger, like you guys, you've got the energy to do it. I used to have tons of energy but didn't know what to do with it. Now yeah. you can put your energy into your work and it doesn't matter if it fails because you can do another piece. You've got the energy for it. Do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, with, with that, let's finish up. So uh, have do to it. Go. All right. You've got three minutes to give us your final words. Oh, I, I've got nothing more to say. You've got more out of me in, in this hour than anyone has got out of me in years. You've done very well, Arnu. You've done very well. But it's at the end of the day, the essence is all about being creative and not being smart, not worrying about money. I know those are things that we all have on this planet, but how do we manage that to a minimal? If we do with our heart do things that we believe in, Surely there's got to be a take. Surely there's got to be a take up for it. Someone's going to see. Someone else is going to see some uniqueness in what you do. Someone else is going to see that this is worth something. Um, if otherwise, at the end of the day, when you come to the other end of your life, what you got to? You're not going to say, "Well, um, I worked really hard for that person for all those years." You're not going to think of that. You're going to think, "Oh, wow, what a waste of time." You want to be able to think towards the end of your life that you've achieved just one, maybe one thing that it has been amazing, that this has been amazing for. That's what I feel. And I'm still, wait, and I'm still waiting to find out what mine is. But I'm enjoying the journey. It is fantastic. 
Okay. Excellent. That's great. That's brilliant. Thank I you so much. Thinking. Uh, I want to see some thinking coming on from you guys in the in the weeks ahead. Okay. Uh, we've got <laughs> we're thinking all the time. That's the problem with us. We're thinking all the time, but we don't. Really? We seem to be running out of energy to do things. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it uh, from all of us here, um, both myself and um, Evan, uh, yep. wherever you guys are, and my uh, special guest Richard, wherever you guys are, keep well, uh, take care of each other, be at peace, kakite ano until next time, we'll see you again. Thank you for watching. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>